second year in a row on stage and uh, with this incredible audience. And I'm also happy to talk about three things that get me completely excited uh, staying here on stage the last couple of, couple of months. One is I'm going to talk about mobility and a completely different approach to mobility. I'm going to talk about, secondly, um, quantum computing. And I'm also going to announce a partnership, um, I'll get to that later, between the two biggest companies in their respective field and uh, what they want to do together. But let me uh, jump into um, mobility and how you approach mobility. Typically, there are two approaches to mobility. The one on uh, the left-hand side is uh, the mobility concepts that are discussed these days. Autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, ride-sharing, ride-hailing, get services, Uber services. They all have one thing in common. They focus on the vehicle, and they focus on the consumer utilizing that vehicle. That's one approach. But I guarantee to you, if we don't change anything else, we'll have traffic jams of autonomous vehicles and Uber cars in the near future. So there has to be more than just focusing on a vehicle and a service. And that's what we call a crowd-centric approach. And if you step back and look at a big urban city like Tokyo, Hong Kong, like Barcelona, like Lisbon, um, step back and look at the people moving in that city, there's another approach. And I'm going to talk about that approach, how we're experimenting in impacting how a metropolis manages um, mobility in the future. So if you look at mobility, demand, and supply, it's defined by data and by context. What does that mean? If you look at weather, weather in a city has a tremendous impact on mobility. Snow, no bicycles. Rain, less bicycles, more uh, passenger cars. Um, flooding in Barcelona, every time it rains, there are areas, streets flooded, so that traffic jams created 30 minutes after a rain-specific area. So tremendous impact. If you look at the cars themselves, this is a map of Tokyo, a picture of Tokyo, where um, most cars are connected online. They're sending their data, so there are sensors basically sending data the whole time about their speed and their geolocation. You have traffic systems becoming more and more intelligent, sending data to data lakes. Where many cities, um, and I refer to Barcelona, uh, have built data lakes where they collect all the data from from their infrastructure. And um, traffic lights can be switched intelligently in the future. Algorithms will say when it's green, when it's red. And then, of course, you have the road system. Road systems determine more or less how mobility works in the city. Narrow roads, many lanes, um, one-way, multiple-way um, roads. So this all um, is defining how, how mobility works in a metropolitan environment. And last not least, the people. I mean, people going to work every morning between 8.30 and 9 and leaving 5 five to six o'clock called rush hour generating traffic. And, um, and the way they work determines how mobility is, uh, is developing in a city. And if you look at the stadium, uh, Web Summit is a great example. There are events on the calendar on a time, time scale where things will change. 64,000 people being here in the next couple of days. In the morning, you're stuck. Uh, on Sunday morning, you won't be stuck on the same route. If you look at the Benfica Stadium, 64,000, same number, by the way, people can go into the stadium you're going to watch fo uh, soccer every second Saturday in a month. One hour after before and one hour after that soccer match, traffic is a completely different scenario. So all of that basically is defining the context, what people do, how they move, uh, and the different um, influencing elements define what mobility in a, in a big city uh, looks like. So eventually, what we're all dreaming of is to come from chaos to order, to come from the left-hand side. This is a picture of Mumbai. And uh, by the way, the little truck in the, uh, tractor in the background, even farming equipment is moving around in the city, to the right-hand side, where we organize and manage and orchestrate mobility. And one way to do it is using brute force and intelligence. Brute force is high-speed supercomputers combined with algorithms. And what we experimented in March this year were the first company using a quantum computer out of Canada from D-Wave to basically dissolve a traffic jam in, uh, in the city of Beijing be before it, uh, it happened. The way, the way you can approach it, and this is really experimental, is to use machine learning at its best. And machine learning does one thing. It learns to recognize patterns, patterns of movement of mobility in an urban environment and can put context together. A street, one o'clock in the afternoon, thousands of uh, students coming out of school, that is going to be traffic. So uh, algorithms can learn by geolocating point of interest and human behavior 
how traffic develops. Once machine learning has a pattern detected, obviously what you can do is you can run prediction on it. So, so what we tried to accomplish was to predict hotspots 45 minutes ahead before they happen. When you run Google Maps, you see traffic now. You're stuck now. So the idea is how can we pull that moment back and uh, do it 45 minutes earlier? And once you've done that, once you have a prediction, this is going to happen, then you move it to uh, another um, high-speed computer. In that case, we use a quantum machine to optimize it in less than one second, 10,000 cars, and reroute them. And then you can send the routing to, uh, to every object, every car, uh, or iPhone, or smartphone, uh, in, in an urban environment. So, so this is the idea um, uh, behind um, really using supercomputing and, and machine learning to, to manage traffic in a, in a completely different way. So phase one, that's what we did. We used um, high GPUs and, um, to compute that and uh, a quantum machine to optimize. And in the near future, and we talk about maybe three to four years, quantum computing, we'll get to that in a minute, will be so advanced and available that we believe even the machine learning side, the AI side of the house, can be, can be done uh, with a, 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 quantum, a quantum machine. This is an example of a platform we, we are building. And this is a prediction. You see the, the slider to the right goes into the future, predicting in Sichuan Bridge in, uh, in Beijing, traffic accumulating based on algorithms. So you see the more you go into the future, in two and a half hours from now, this bridge will be crowded. Everyone who knows Beijing, this is a common problem. So, so that platform uh, we have built is based on, uh, just to name that, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, we are now moving it to um, a Google Cloud Platform. Uh, using TensorFlow algorithms is predicting traffic based on huge, massive data coming in. So we are, we are literally inhaling data into this platform from connected vehicles, from traffic systems, from data lakes of, uh, of, uh, of cities, anything that is accessible to us, um, um, mobility apps that we uh, hand out to customers. So we, we collect all of the data and really mesh it. Then we put context on top of it, point of interest, and, um, and uh, calendars, events, sporting events. So anything you can ingest from the web basically goes into this platform and is feeding the algorithms to come up with um, a prediction uh, of what could happen. And that prediction that you have right here, that you can move on and do something else with it. And um, now it's not working. So as an example, while you're going to the airport, this is your NAV system. Um, the route is calculated based on the a, on a current um, traffic situation. This is standard, right? So the next step is um, prediction is sent into the vehicle uh, and indicated to the driver uh, where traffic is going to happen with a timestamp when it's going to happen. So we know you're going to be there on your route in about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then traffic is going to happen. And um, the route's being recalculated dynam dynamically um, with quantum computing in the background, and we call the quantum routes, and sent back and updating your, your, um, your NAS system. Why is that important? In the future, autonomous vehicles will have to have a constant connectivity to the internet. So we will constantly monitor the vehicles for health status anyway. So a, a, an autonomous vehicle is always monitored for security and for health. So by having this connectivity, you can download information and basically impact um, the way the autonomous vehicle chooses its route. And even more so, if you go one step back and think about the crowd, if all the cars get a routing that basically shows them how to get best from A to B, and the car behind me gets a different route than the car behind him, and behind him that's how you dissolve traffic in a much smarter way. So this is a vision that we are experimenting with. And um, what you need to, to do uh, to do that is high performance computing, massive compute power. And this is why quantum computing uh, is um, the big hope. It's a massive data integration and management issue because you really pull in, you vacuum in all the data you can get. And um, you need connectivity of objects, vehicles, infrastructure. And, uh, and more importantly, on top of that, you're running um, optimization and deep learning algorithms. So these are the ingredients to bake a cake um, that could change the way mobility is, is managed in the near future. And um, because of that, we are announcing today on, uh, on Web Summit uh, a fascinating um, alliance. It's a quantum alliance, a partnership between 
the two biggest companies in, the, in their field, uh, we as a car manufacturer and Google are partnering to work together on using quantum computing machine learning uh, and, uh, and de develop algorithms. It's in the beginning highly experimental, but we have the first algorithms on the way that, that uh, could be uh, in production, production really soon. So I'm, I'm really happy and proud um, to have um, Google as a partner and um, there's much more you can do with quantum computing. Besides mobility, we look into enterprise applications um, in supply chain management using a quantum machine to optimize supply chain. It's a highly complex traveling salesman issue for planning purposes, but also for material science. So one project we're working on is battery efficiency to use quantum mechanics in a quantum computer to simulate um, batteries for electric vehicles to get a, a better output out of batteries. Um, robotics and uh, mobility as I as I pointed on with that I would like to switch over to California to my partner and friend Pat Nevin he is one of the top researchers in quantum computing and head of the um, Google quantum AI uh, lab in um, Santa Barbara and I hope it's going to work oh Hello, Lisbon. This is a message from Google in California. I'm Hartmut Neven. I'm the founder and manager of the Google Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab. I wanted to thank uh, Volkswagen's uh, CIO, Martin Hoffman, for having had uh, the interest and foresight to start off our collaboration. We are very much looking forward to it. So this is a very exciting time for quantum computing. In our hardware lamps, we have reached the point where we have a sufficient number of qubits and equally important, an ability to control those qubits to a very high degree of fidelity that we soon expect to reach a milestone that is known as quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy is a term that describes a situation where you have a quantum processor and it executes a well-defined computational task, a benchmark task, in a short time, let's say in a second, where even the fastest classical supercomputer would take an unreasonably long time, let's say a year, to solve the same benchmark task. So I want to give you some examples where we believe that near-term quantum processors can have an impact for applications in the real world. One area is quantum simulation. We like to refer to this as Richard Feynman's original killer app. Because Richard Feynman was the first one to realize that classical computers are ill-suited to model systems where quantum phenomena play an essential role. So in Richard Feynman's words, nature is not classical, goddammit, and if you want to simulate it, you better make your simulator quantum mechanical. So you may say, oh, this sounds rather self-serving that the quantum computing guys are saying one good application is this simulation of quantum systems. But it is actually very important because there are many cases where you need to manipulate nature or matter to a fine enough degree that quantum effects do matter a lot in the automotive space. There's a huge disruption going on moving to electromobility. But as we all know, batteries are still heavy and they still take a lot of time to charge. Now, if you look a little bit at a battery and see electrochemistry problems involved, you find there's a whole bunch of construction sites, so to speak, within a battery that require attention. Currently, there is no simulation ability. That means if an engineer has an exciting idea how to use a different cassette material or move to a solid state electrolyte, then the only way to see whether this idea works, he needs to build the system, go in the lab and measure it, which is by its very nature slow. So having access to near-term quantum processors may revolutionize this, that now we may have the ability to check a large set of possible cassette materials or electrolytes much quicker and focus expensive lab time only on the most promising candidates. So another application area for near-term quantum processes is quantum-enhanced optimization. Optimization problems often can be so hard because there is often such a huge number of different um, possibilities 
that classical computers are just stumped, that uh, they will take way too long time to find a good, let alone the best, solution. But using quantum resources, one can actually prove that you can accelerate finding good solutions to optimization problems. So if we can accelerate optimization, we can accelerate machine learning, which in turn is the main discipline of artificial intelligence. We are very grateful that uh, Volkswagen shows this keen interest and the foresight to try to kick the tires of uh, quantum computing and see whether early quantum processes that have passed the quantum supremacy frontier but don't have enough extra qubits yet to do error correction are indeed capable already to do impactful work in the automotive space. So thank you, Martin, for initiating our collaboration, which should be very interesting, and I'm looking very much forward to it. And uh, thank you, Lisbon, for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Hartmut. Uh, we're playing with quantum computers, but we didn't trust the video te uh, technology, so, so we pre-recorded this to make sure that we can, can show it on stage. Having said that, um, exciting times for us, and um, I'm really proud to have a great partner on our side, and um, I wish you a great conference. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.